The story I'll be telling today will include situations and vocabulary which may be distressing to some listeners. It's a good story. It's an important story. But if you are uncomfortable with the great variety of human sexuality, this episode might be a lot. Just letting you know. On with the show. Now I got a head like a lit cigarette. Unholy clouds reflect in a minaret so high above me, higher than everyone. Where are you in the cedars of Lebanon? You too, 2009. Hello, and welcome to The Wonders of the World, the podcast that visits the great places on Earth to tell the story of our people, our civilization, and our planet. This week, episode 39, the sixth wonder of the Hellenistic era, the ruins of Heliopolis in Baalbek, Lebanon. I am going to have challenges saying today's country, Lebanon. I say that because I grew up in Middle Tennessee, and I currently live in central Indiana. And in both places, there is a town which is spelled like Lebanon, but pronounced Lebanon. So, it's quite possible that Lebanon will you know, let itself out there. I'll try to edit through that, but one might slip through post-production. It's a very little country, Lebanon, the smallest on the Asian mainland, but it has had an immense impact on world history. I'm delighted to be able to talk about it because Lebanon has given the world so much and has received so little credit in exchange. We're also going to pick up the story of the Severan dynasty from last episode. Then, we left the Roman Empire in the hands of Caracalla, the most evil emperor Rome ever had. Soon, the purple would be passed to his young cousin, who might be less evil, but is endlessly more fascinating. And to talk about him, I am delighted to have Scott Chesworth from the Ancient World podcast, one of the absolute masters of the medium. He'll be on later on in the show, so stay tuned. First, we need to lay out some of the history of Lebanon before we move forward. For most of its history, Lebanon has been tied with its larger next-door neighbor, Syria. And I've got an episode on Syria to do next, and then another one in a few months. So I won't spend much time on it today, but I'll use the term Syrian to refer to some of the ancient people from the area now called Lebanon. Before it was Syria, though, it was Phoenicia. I promised I would talk about them now, and so I shall. I'm like rock. I keep my promises. The Phoenicians were a remarkable people by ancient standards, because they were very much not the typical empire of conquest. They were merchants, traders. They, they never had an empire. They never were an empire. They were much more like the Greeks would be, a loose affiliation of millionaires and billionaires, and maybe I'll leave out the random Paul Simon references. We've met the Phoenicians already for their colony at Carthage, but I'd like to highlight their greatest gift, the one that gets them on all the best of historical mixtapes, the alphabet. We take it for granted, but try learning one of the languages that doesn't have a Phoenician-derived alphabet, and you'll realize its value. A symbol for every consonant, and in the case of the alphabets that followed it, one for every vowel. Although some languages are more consistent about which letters have which sounds than others. That's why I love Spanish. A letter in Spanish always makes the same sound. Always, 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 always. God bless them. The earliest example we have of the Phoenician alphabet in use is on a sarcophagus of a ruler from the town of Byblos in 1000 BCE. It reads, If any king or governor or army commander exposes this coffin, then let his judicial scepter be broken. Let his royal throne be overthrown. Let a vagabond efface his inscription. So don't touch. Or get someone who wasn't a king or governor or army commander to touch, apparently. See, that feels like a big loophole. <laughs> Byblos was one of the city-states which dominated the Phoenician coast, along with Tyre and Sidon. Together they show up again and again in Bronze Age history and myth, because just to the east stands a mountain range called Mount Lebanon. There grew the famous cedars, the great trees whose wood lined the Temple of Jerusalem. 
built the ships that plied the Med and was the goal of many an Egyptian army advance. In the desert, there aren't a lot of trees, but Lebanon had big ones. The Phoenicians knew this and used it to their advantage, selling wood to get rich and using that money to pay off whatever imperial overlord happened to be in the area. Egypt, the Mitanni, the Hittites, Assyria, Persia, Macedonia, the Seleucids, and finally Rome. Once Pompey cleared the Sea of Pirates, Phoenicia embarked on a whole new golden age, buying, selling, trading, making loads of money across the Mediterranean. The Romans built a new colony for retired soldiers on the site of a small Phoenician village called Beratus. Today, we call it Beirut, the Paris of the East. Now, on the other side of Mount Lebanon lay the two Syrian provinces, Syria proper to the north, home to Antioch, today's Antakya, the great eastern city of the empire, and Kurla Syria, which means hollow Syria, hollow because it's inland, I guess. Kurla Syria had three cities instrumental to our story, each of which will get its own episode. That's pretty darn impressive for one little Roman province. One of those cities was the ancient city of Damascus, perhaps the most ancient city in the world. We'll get back to Damascus in due time. The second city is Heliopolis, but we can't talk about Heliopolis without first crossing the border back into Syria proper to talk about a different city, Emesa, that Syrian city where Julia Domna lived, waiting for her king, Septimius Severus, to come. Emesa, today's Homs, was still home to her family and the great temple of the god El Gabal. Gabal means mountain, similar to Arabic Jabal. And El Gabal was a mountain god, or rather had been a mountain god, by Julia Domna's day, El Gabal had made a transition to becoming a sun god and was the only god worth worshipping for the Emesenes. Now, out east in Syria, proximity to Persia and the Zoroastrian religion led to quite a bit of syncretism, the notion that all gods were aspects of one single god. And for the Emesenes, that god was El Gabal. El Gabal was unlike Greek or Roman anthropomorphic gods. The Emesenes didn't have human-like statues of him. He didn't have human form. The historian Herodian writes, The temple does, however, contain a huge black stone with a pointed end and round base in the shape of a cone. The Emesenes solemnly maintain that this stone came down from Zeus. Pointing out certain small figures in relief, they assert that it is the unwrought image of the sun, for naturally that is what they wish to see. It's interesting that Herodian uses the term Zeus there, because clearly the Emesenes didn't think the stone came from Zeus, they thought the stone came from El Gabal. That's the point. Now this sort of stone is often called a beetle, and was thought to be imbued with supernatural powers. These beetles were often meteorites, which makes sense, right? If they're objects dropped by the gods, and were fairly common around the Middle East in those days, it makes sense that that would actually be a meteorite. We'll meet another one of these beetles in a few episodes. Now, when we pick up our story, on the other side of Syria, Caracalla was camped in Karai. With him was one of the Praetorian prefects, a Berber from Mauritania named Macrinus. He was 52, a lawyer by trade of equestrian rank, someone who had risen to the rank of Praetorian prefect mainly because Caracalla had killed so many other candidates. Macrinus had a problem. Back west, a fortune teller had declared that he, Macrinus, would be emperor, which might sound like a great fortune to get, but when Caracalla is actually the emperor, it's bad news. You don't want anyone to know that some fortune teller is saying that you're going to be the emperor when Caracalla currently holds the position. So Macrinus laughed at first when he heard it. You're joking, right? No, your grace, you'll be the emperor. Well, don't tell anyone. I must tell the world. No, you don't. I'm trying to stay alive, which has nothing to do with being emperor. Please be quiet. But he would not be quiet. Eventually, word got back to Caracalla's people in Rome. They wrote a letter. Uh, sir, some crazy prophet says Macrinus is going to be the emperor. You might want to kill him. 
Sincerely, your people in Rome. Back in Syria, Caracalla was about to go for a ride when the mail delivery arrived. Caracalla had inherited his father's hatred of paperwork. Macrinus, he said, look through those letters, will you? You're a lawyer, you're good at that. Take care of anything routine. And off he rode. Macrinus, looking through the letters, found the one from Caracalla's people in Rome. And promptly removed it. Nothing to see here. So there was his problem. He knew it was only a matter of time before another letter would come. Did you kill Macrinus yet? Just asking. And then what? Would he be able to catch that one in time too? And what happens after they all return to Rome? Nope, his goose was cooked for sure. Unless... Caracalla and the army were at Karai, and the emperor had the idea of checking out the local temple. So he called together a few guards and horsemen, including Macrinus, to join him on the side trip. And as they were riding to the temple, nature called, and the emperor stopped by the side of the road for what the consultants these days call a bio-break. There, a soldier walked up to him. Caracalla's guards went to block the soldier, you know, that's their job, but they glanced up to Macrinus to double check. He shrugged and waved them down. It's no big deal, just a messenger. Well, the soldier then pulled out a dagger and thus ended Caracalla, most evil of Rome's emperors. His bodyguard slew his assassin, and then everyone turned to Macrinus. Uh, what should we do? We need a new emperor. They offered the job to the other prefect first, but he didn't want it. Caracalla had no children, so shifting their feet, the Praetorians asked Macrinus. Well, dang, the fortune teller was right after all. Who'd a thunk? The story of how Macrinus became emperor is far more interesting than the story of what he did once he was emperor. You see, he should not have been emperor. He wasn't of senatorial rank, the first emperor ever not to be. He wasn't much of a general, he wasn't particularly rich, he didn't have any natural base of support. Other than Mauritania, the least populated province in the empire. But he tried anyway. Arrayed against him were two women. Julia Domna, wife of Septimius Severus and mother of Caracalla, and her sister Julia Mesa. He, wisely, didn't trust either of them, or Julia Mesa's two daughters, each of whom had a son. So he exiled them from Rome, sending them back to Emesa. Should have killed them. He didn't. Bad Macrinus. Julia Domna starved herself to death rather than face exile. Her sister, Julia Mesa, took a different approach. Her plan was revenge. In Emesa, her oldest grandson was invested as high priest of El Cabal. And just as in ancient Mexico, where high priests would take the name of their god, remember Topiltzin Quetzalcoatl, so did young Bassianus start to go by the name history would remember him by, Elagabalus. Julia Mesa came up with a shrewd idea. She remembered how much the army loved Caracalla, and why not? He paid them very well while killing everyone else. So she let slip a rumor that Elagabalus was actually Caracalla's son, which if anyone stopped to do the math or the genetics, was absolutely wrong. Elagabalus was 13, which meant that Caracalla would have had to have impregnated his first cousin when he was 14, which is awkward. But the troops loved Caracalla, and Macrinus was doing the old, maybe I should get the finances of the empire in order routine, which meant not giving raises. We saw how well that worked out for Galba and Pertinax. So the third Gallic legion stationed near Emesa happily proclaimed the now 14-year-old emperor. Macrinus never even made it to Rome. He had stayed in Antioch to manage things, and 15 months after Caracalla's death, he now joined him in the afterlife and the young Elagabalus was now emperor. To prepare the Senate and the people of Rome for his arrival, Julia Mesa had his painting sent there, with orders to have it hung in prime position in the Senate. And now, 
they all could see the most unique emperor in Roman history, and they did not like the look of him at all. The boy, he was only 14, the youngest emperor to date, was dressed in the long purple silken robes of a Syrian high priest. He wore golden necklaces, bracelets, and a bejeweled tiara, and makeup. Oh, I see, said the very conservative, very masculine Roman Senate. I am extremely delighted to have Scott Chesworth from the Ancient World podcast on today uh, to talk about Elagabalus. Your recent series covering the bloodline, as you call it, from Cleopatra through Julia Domna is just a remarkable bit of podcasting. And I really encourage everyone to take a listen to it because it's just tremendous work. Oh, thanks very much. He's on a lot of historians' worst ever lists of Roman emperors. But if you look at what he did, I mean, he feels like it's nowhere near as awful as some of his predecessors, Caracalla or Commodus or Nero or Caligula. He's not crazy like that. He doesn't kill a lot of people. He doesn't lead Rome again in terrible wars like a Valerian. He doesn't uh, destroy the empire right. <laughs> and ruin the golden <laughs> age like Commodus does. He's not effective necessarily, but doesn't seem like the worst to the degree that some of these others have been and, and would be. So it just feels like a lot of it is just hatred from the historians, the traditional conservative Roman elite. I'm trying to get a handle on what they hated about him most, if you will. Was it, <laughs> was it his personal style or his sexual habits, or was it that religious change of bringing in this new supreme god from the mountain that just rankled them so? Like, what was it about him that got under their skin so badly? He was such an interesting and bizarre character. There definitely, I think, for the Roman establishment was plenty to dislike. We all had this picture of Elagabalus arriving as this exotic alien from the east, you know, with, again, his eye makeup and his silks and his crown and his, you know, gems, etc. Right. The funny part about his history is he was actually mostly raised in Rome, yeah. which is counterintuitive. You follow the career of his father, Sextus Varius Marcellus, and there are records. And his positions from the time of Elagabalus's birth were either in Rome or he had some prominent positions in Britain. So it's funnily enough the very young Elagabalus was fully indoctrinated into, you know, Roman lifestyle, the Roman lifestyle of the Severan court, mm. and then possibly spent some time in Britain. And he actually didn't end up going east until Caracalla's famous Common Enemy of Mankind tour in <laughs> 214. Right. Right. where Caracalla was heading east to, you know, go visit Egypt and Syria. And he took Elagabalus and, you know, most of his family along with him. Elagabalus was actually at that point slated to accept the role of high priest of Elagabal and Emesa because the previous high priest, who was Julia Domna's father, Julius Bassianus, had just passed away recently. Oh, okay. So Elagabalus, until he was 11... Nothing super exotic other than, again, being raised in the Severan court. But from 11 to 15, when he was high priest in Emesa, I think it's pretty safe to say those were very formative years for him. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> very and clearly. He was fully indoctrinated into this extremely exotic Eastern cult with drumming and singing and dancing and sacrifices and all of this. It was apparently quite a show. I mean, Herodian and others give really detailed descriptions of worship services. He was basically a local megastar. You know, apparently Roman centurions used to just fight each other for tickets to go watch the latest worship service because it was just so crazy and exotic. So That's just wild. <laughs> it is, it is. He comes to Rome and brings it with him, you know. Yeah, 
they send the painting along yes. to get them right prepared for it. They're terrified of what they see. Yes. And uh, and it just it's just a cultural clash. It, it very much is. The story of his elevation is entertaining too, which is, you know, according to one source, his father passed away and his mom started dating a young athlete, this guy named Ganny's. And essentially, one day, mom's new boyfriend, Ganes, basically grabbed Elagabalus. He could see that the current emperor, the usurper Macrinus, was not very popular. No. So he grabbed Elagabalus, went to the closest legionary base, and had him elevated, you know, as Roman emperor. And the legionaries were fine with him. They backed the plan. And then this, you know, kind of mini civil war started between the Severans, you know, and Macrinus. And funnily enough, it was Elagabalus who was responsible for the decisive victory. Wow. This kid, which again, we have these very strong images of his, you know, decadence and etc. This kid, at this critical moment, grabbed his sword and went charging into battle on horseback and turned the tide. I think it's kind of like in the Deadpool movie where you don't have to be a hero every minute of your life, but four or five <laughs> moments. And I think that was Elagabalus's moment. Uh. Once his grandmother, Julia Mesa, sent the painting ahead, showing not only him in his full, you know, kind of exotic mode, but also showing the black stone of Elagabal, you know, his god. You can just kind of hear the sounds of jaws dropping in the Senate. And yeah, it's it was... Definitely portended an enormous culture clash. So, yes. And that's another thing I, was, I don't quite understand, because Julia Mesa had been in Rome for a very long time as well. Yes. And she shows herself throughout his reign as well as then into Alexander's to be a very shrewd operator. She spread the rumor that, that Elagabalus was Caracalla's kid, even though that's gross right. to think about. Yes, <laughs> and, yes. Uh, even in Roman times, that would be gross to think about. <laughs> she seems so on top of the politics and able to run things effectively and, and be able to sort of put things in, in, in place. It feels like such a big misstep to show Elagabalus in all this Eastern glory in advance of his coming there instead of showing having him in a in you know, a, a, a Roman battle toga you know like I just I don't I don't get it well what I view it is an attempt at some harm reduction I think what she was trying to do was lay the groundwork because Elagabalus was going to do what Elagabalus was going to do he made that pretty clear early on because Ganes was trying to kind of rein in a few of his excesses early on, and basically Elagabalus just killed him. So after that, Julia Mesa became a little bit of a silent partner. But yeah, I think she sent the painting ahead just so the Romans would have time to digest the fact that the emperor coming their way was going to be a bit of a tough pill to swallow. So kind of trying to defuse it, hoping maybe the greatest part of the outrage would would be diffused by the time he actually showed up. Mm, but of course, mm. you know, when he showed up, he did nothing to, <laughs> to try to accommodate or acclimate or anything like that. He came with the Blackstone in tow, and he basically did whatever he wanted. One thing that was kind of funny was, you know, he started doing this daily worship, which, you know, again, Elagabalus is a sun god. So I'm assuming this was a dawn worship in Rome at this brand new temple he had constructed. And he made all the senators come and watch every day. And so if you're a senator in Rome, you got to set your alarm for <laughs> dawn, you know, when Elagabalus is on the clock, because you've got to come or, you know, heaven help you if you're seen not showing up for the uh, the daily worship services. But he openly flaunted his bisexuality. His, you know, most committed relationship was with his uh, chariot driver, who was a Carian slave named Hierocles. He did, you know, things like letting his mother and grandmother sit in meetings of the Senate. If you believe the Historia Augusta, he actually even instituted a new female-only Senate on the Quirinal Hill as well. So. You know, there's tons of other salacious stories like there is with Caligula and Tiberius, you know, of a more personal nature. Right. But yeah, he just did whatever he wanted and did not care. As Scott mentioned, 
It wasn't just that Elagabalus loved the fineries. He was really into his religion. Now, a personal side note. When I was 14, I was an altar server in my local Catholic church. And at that age, there was something remarkably powerful to me about feeling that I was the agent of God, and that by following the precise rituals of the Mass, I was doing my own small part to keep the earth turning and to keep God from smiting us. Very powerful feeling. And that's just being the assistant to a priest in Tennessee. Now imagine being the high priest of the only God that mattered, and emperor of the most powerful empire in the history of the world. At 14, the world and the heavens literally revolved around him. That goes to the head. So he continued to perform his rituals even while emperor. And this wasn't some quiet, restrained Roman prayer. Herodian writes, He erected a huge and magnificent temple to his god and surrounded it with numerous altars. Coming forth early each morning, he sacrificed there hecatombs of bulls and a vast number of sheep. These he placed upon the altars and heaped up spices of every kind. He also set before the altars many jars of the oldest and finest wines, so that the streams of blood mingled with streams of wine. Heliogobalus danced around the altars to music played on every kind of instrument. Women from his own country accompanied him in these dances, carrying cymbals and drums as they circled the altars. The entire senate and all the knights stood watching, like spectators at the theater. Spectators indeed. They watched in horror as he built that temple to Elagabal on the Palatine Hill. They watched in horror as he forced a vestal virgin to marry him so that they could have gods for children. They watched in horror as he paraded the stone of Emesa through the streets on a chariot with no driver, him walking backwards holding the reins as he stared into the face of his god. But above all, they watched in horror as Elagabalus was, well, not traditionally masculine. Yes, he had five different wives in four years, one of them twice, but they were good friends more than anything else. His strongest relationship, according to Cassius Dio, was with a charioteer named Hierocles. He called himself Hierocles' wife and Hierocles' queen. Herodian and Cassius Dio both lived during Elagabalus' reign. They saw it firsthand. And while it might be in their interest for them to negatively portray him, most of their writings have the grain of truth. And their stories get even more salacious to conservative Romans' ears. Elagabalus shaved his beard and plucked out his body hair. He selected men for important palace positions based on the size of their private parts. He would have affairs with other men solely to encourage Hierocles' jealousy and then proudly walk around with black eyes when the charioteer would beat him. He asked surgeons to give him female genitalia. They didn't, and you can only imagine how that would have turned out, but he asked. Once he brought on a new favorite with a remarkably large, you know, I'm just going to let Cassius Dio describe it. This man, Zodicus, not only had a body that was beautiful all over, seeing that he was an athlete, but in particular he greatly surpassed all others in the size of his uh, privates. This fact was reported to the emperor by those who were on the lookout for such things, and the man was suddenly whisked away from the games and brought to Rome, accompanied by an immense escort. He was appointed cubicularius before he had even been seen by the emperor, was honored by the name of the latter's grandfather, Avidus, was adorned with garlands as at a festival, and entered the palace lighted by the glare of many torches. Elagabalus, on seeing him, sprang up with rhythmic movements, and then, when Zodocus addressed him with the usual salutation, My Lord Emperor, hail! He bent his neck so as to assume a ravishing female pose, and turning his eyes upon him with a melting glaze, answered without any hesitation, Call me not lord, for I am a lady. Then Elagabalus immediately joined him in the bath, and finding him, when stripped to be equal to his reputation, burned with even greater lust, reclined on his breast, and took dinner 
like some beloved mistress in his bosom. But Hierocles, fearing that Zodocus would captivate the emperor more completely than he himself could, and that he might therefore suffer some terrible fate at his hands, as often happens in the case of rival lovers, caused the cupbearers, who were well disposed toward him, to administer a drug that abated the other's manly prowess. And so Zodocus, after a whole night of embarrassment, being unable to secure a, uh, was deprived of all of the honors that he had received, and was driven out of the palace, out of Rome, and later out of the rest of Italy. And this, actually, saved his life. There are other stories as well, from a book called the Historia Augusta, which was written by an anonymous author likely about 170 years after his reign. Now, most historians put the Historia Augusta as about 25% accurate, which isn't great. These stories are fun, but less likely to be true. Stories about how he would throw dinner parties and give random gifts like tigers and lions to his guests, or that he would conduct human sacrifice at his temple, or that instead of throwing coins into a cheering crowd, he would toss oxen, camels, or even slaves to be fought over or that he would eat only the rarest of foods like peacock tongue and flamingo brains, or that, quote, when his friends became drunk, he would often shut them up and suddenly during the night let in his lions and leopards and bears, all of them harmless, so that his friends on awakening at dawn, or worse, during the night, would find lions and leopards and bears in the room with them, unquote. Or that he once asked his slaves to collect a thousand pounds of spider webs. There's a lot more, but frankly, most of it feels too over the top to be real, especially since if these last few stories had been real, Cassius Dio and Herodian would have happily mentioned them. With the makeup and the jewelry and the robes and the relationships with men and the demanding that people call him lady, modern authors, or at least some of them, have started to call Elagabalus the first known transgender ruler in history. I've seen books that have even changed the pronouns, calling him she, saying he asked. And maybe he's certainly gay. That's very clear. But transgender? The problem we have is these histories were written by dudes like Cassius Dio and Herodian, who really did not like him. So we honestly don't know how many of these stories are really true. I mean, yes, he no doubt wore silk and he liked men, but did he really think of himself as a woman? Or was he just a teenager with unlimited power and a great desire for sexual experimentation? It's just hard to say. I mean, if you look at his bust, he wore a tidy mustache and incredible 1970s style sideburns. So he wasn't completely feminine. He just seems like a kid who liked to have a good time at Studio 54. Now, whatever was happening, it was messing with Julia Mesa's plans for control of the empire, and she had been doing a really nice job. She and her daughter, Elagabalus' mother, named Julia Somaeus, had been seated in the Senate, something which had never happened before. I mean, Nero's mother had sat in, but she had been hidden by a curtain. Here were women in the wide open. Julia Mesa had thought that Elagabalus would be so readily controlled. He was so young and attractive and initially popular. He should have been the start of a great dynasty. But instead, he was rubbing everyone the uh, wrong way. And now, he was starting to think for himself and not listen to Grandma. That's not going to work. When she saw all this going on, and really, I think the straw that was breaking some camel's backs was he announced the intention to elevate his lover Hierocles to be his Caesar. Yeah. <laughs> she just knew that was not going to fly. She starts looking for options, and it turns out she has a pretty wonderful option. She has another daughter, and that daughter has another son. Mm. And that's uh, Alexander Severus. Right, right. And so she basically convinces Elagabalus you know, hey, couldn't you use some help around the palace? <laughs> Look at your little, young, friendly, non-threatening cousin, Severus Alexander. 
you know, how about elevating him to Caesar? Sounds great. And somehow she convinces him to do it. <laughs> and it's not long before Elagabalus figures out he's actually created a rival. And everyone likes Alexander Severus better. Yeah. Or Severus Alexander. Right. Because it's interesting then, too, because he would have had the exact same trajectory, in, you know, being raised in Rome and then spending, you know, four years or so in, in Emesa and then coming back right. to Rome. So he would have the same right. thing. But he's, there's no description of him having gone native, or having <laughs> gone Eastern, if you will. Right. And there's nothing in there that indicates he's anything other than a good Roman lad. Yes, and the sources credit it to his mother. She was very good at keeping bad influences away from him, keeping him on a regimen, keeping him occupied with matters of state and learning and, and all these good things. And the legionaries in particular took a real shine to him and the Praetorian Guard, etc. And really, you know, Elagopolis' end came when he basically said he was going to demote Severus or Severus Alexander as Caesar. The Praetorian Guard just went on strike, and they say, you are not. You're going to bring him unharmed to our camp and show us that you're not trying to pull a fast one or, or you know, do anything to hurt him. They both kind of roll into the Praetorian camp, and everyone cheers Severus Alexander and just totally ignores Elagabalus. <laughs> Elagabalus has an obvious fit, and they just stab him to death. Based on what you read about his character, you kind of figure the one thing you can't do to Elagopoulos is ignore him. <laughs> and that was it. And he, he threw down the, the law and they said, OK, well, we've got all these swords and you don't have any. So <laughs> bye. <laughs> Thus passed Elagopoulos, transgender emperor. Maybe. Look, he wasn't great at all, but he wasn't nearly as bad as the historians indicate. The empire didn't fall apart during his four-year reign. He didn't lose any battles. He didn't cause any riots or rebellions other than a couple of small ones, which were quickly put down. He didn't slaughter thousands. He didn't destroy the economy. He didn't burn the city down while he was playing the fiddle. His crime was being different. And whether that difference was in fact being transgender or just being too Eastern or too sexually active or just being a teenager with far too much power and no one willing and able to tell him no, Elagabalus paid the price. His legacy lasts, though, not in Rome. Alexander Severus, who deferred primarily to his grandma, Julia Mesa, and his mother, Julia Mamea, swiftly shipped the idol of Elagabal back to Emesa and returned the religion to his old ways. No, the legacy is in the process, the continual Easternization of the empire, and maybe, just maybe, in the temples at Baalbek. As before, I tried really hard to find someone who had been to Lebanon to talk to me. I even reached out to a Lebanese friend from school. Nothing. Oh well, we push on. Baalbek is a small town in the Bekaa Valley, the breadbasket of Lebanon. In Roman times, it was called Heliopolis, which means the city of the sun. Interestingly, there aren't that many records of Heliopolis in the ancient sources, which makes it a bit of a mystery. Because in this little agricultural town are the ruins of three immense temples, the largest of which, the Temple of Jupiter, was enormous, with pink granite columns shipped up from Aswan in Egypt. It was 90 meters by 54 meters and 95 meters high. So not as long or wide as the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus, but four times taller. When complete, it had 54 Corinthian columns surrounding it, each one 30 meters high and two and a half meters in diameter. So about as big around and 50% taller than the giant columns in the Temple of Karnak. These columns are the largest ever from antiquity, and six of them are all that remain from this greatest of Roman temples. Now, some fell in the many earthquakes that have hit Lebanon over the years, and others were shipped to Constantinople for use in the place we'll be visiting soon, the Hagia Sophia. Just next door to its south stands a second temple in incredible condition. Nearly complete, the Temple of Bacchus is slightly smaller than the Temple of Jupiter, but it is still as large as the Parthenon and more than twice as tall. 
and it's still well decorated with carvings and even a mosaic of Bacchus enjoying the local wine, which I should point out is still good and available. Lebanon having a significant Christian population means that wine has never gone out of style or demand, and the vineyards of the Baca Valley produce some lovely reds, rather like a Bordeaux. You can spend a day exploring the magnificent ruins, and much as in Leptis Magna, you will be the only one. Baalbek is way too close to the Syrian border for comfort, and most Western governments recommend against travel there. That it's a major center for noted terrorist organization Hezbollah doesn't help with tourist traffic either. It's a shame because it's only a two or three hour drive from Beirut, and trilingual guides, English, French, and Arabic, are available to show you around inexpensively. And with Beirut coming back to full awesomeness, the most vibrant city in the Middle East, or so I've been told, Lebanon is due for a travel renaissance. So you're probably wondering, what's the connection between these temples and Elagabalus? There's a hypothesis that the temples of Baalbek have been misidentified. Right now, we assign them to Jupiter, Bacchus, and Venus, but they weren't like that originally. You look at the Aramaic name Baalbek. Originally, the largest temple would have belonged to the god Baal, right? You've probably heard of him from the Old Testament. Very popular in Mesopotamia, Syria, Phoenicia, Palestine. He's the local sun god. That's why the Greeks gave the city the name Heliopolis during the Macedonian period. That temple was for the sun, at least the one that originally stood there, the Roman masterpiece that came afterwards. That's the question mark. Now we happen to know about another local sun god, don't we? Homs, which was Emesa, has been a popular city for millennia through the Roman, Byzantine, and Arab periods. The great mosque of Al-Nuri sits on the site of what was supposed to be the temple of El Gabal. But between the size and location away from the citadel, that might not be the case. Plus, the temple of Elagabal was supposed to be one of the largest temples in the Roman Empire. If it had been the mosque, we would have more remnants either used in construction there or elsewhere in the city. And we just don't have that. We have very little trace of the temple that stood there. So we have a city without a temple, and we have a temple in Baalbek without a city. What if the temple in Baalbek is actually the great temple of El Gabal. Do you think there's a connection? Yeah, it's a really interesting mystery. The individual who wrote about it, who I first came across, was an archaeologist and historian named Warwick Ball, who wrote a book called Rome in the East. And it's a, it's a fantastic book. I leaned on it pretty heavily for a lot of the um, material in the podcast. On the one hand, there are a lot of contemporary writers who are talking about the magnificence of the Sun Temple of Elagabal or the Temple of Emesene Ball. But we've never been able to locate where that may have been. I mean, like you say, the default, you would assume it would be in the city of Emesa. But there's never been anything conclusively showing that it is a former site of that amazingly huge, elaborate temple. Conversely, you have this amazing temple complex at Baalbek, um, you know, one of the greatest temples in the East, and honestly, one of the most ambitious building works ever undertaken in the Roman world. And where was it erected? In a minor Roman veterans colony, Heliopolis, mm -hmm. with no emperor taking credit for its construction. I mean, you'd think somebody who would be bragging about it and, you know, somewhere in the record saying, I built this magnificent thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's very odd. So they do know when the primary periods where Baalbek was constructed, and it's the first century AD, as well as the latter part of the third century AD. And what that connects with, which is the other part of the story, is the first part connects with the high point of this local Emesene kingdom. 
the one that basically down through the generations would eventually become the family of Julia Domna in Emesa. Right. And then also the latter period of construction coincides with the reigns of the Severan emperors, again, tied with the Emesene royal family. It makes sense. The trickiest connection to make is, I mean, there's a couple, but one of them is Emesa is modern Homs in Syria right. and, you know, Baalbek's in the Bekaa Valley in modern Lebanon. There's some distance there. How would it be logical that this major Emesene temple will be located in Baalbek? And there's a couple things that, you know, kind of help to make the connection. And these are all, again, things that Warwick Ball points out. One of them is that there was a branch of the Emesene royal line that did have power in the local kingdom of Chalcis, which is near Baalbek, during various periods and may have had domination over that area. And also, one of the other funny things is Ela Gabal literally translates to the god of the mountain, you know, Gabal, like Jebel, mm -hmm. like, you know, modern Arabic. So the other question is, why would you have a major deity who's god of the mountain in Emesa, which is a city in lowland, you know, Syria? Right. Uh, maybe where it was actually housed would have been a higher location like mountainous Baalbek. So, again, there are some connections that he makes along those lines. The Black Stone is a meteorite, which some think it could have been. What if it fell and hit around Baalbek? And would it make sense to have the cult be based at the place where the stone fell from the sky as much as having it with the city of Emesa? Yeah, it's funny. I actually had one episode early on where I envisioned a scenario when the conical Black Stone of Elagabal first landed on Earth and just wondering who might have been there to witness it. You know, obviously, you don't want to be witnessing it too close or you would not be alive anymore. <laughs> but it's a question whether they began the cult in the location near where it came down. That does seem reasonable. Or otherwise, in a lot of particularly, you know, Arabic regions and such, there's a, I guess, predilection, maybe the word, of putting deities in elevated places and like high places, etc. So it may have been, and this is a general Semitic thing, not just Arabic, but it may have been taken from where it was found and taken up to an elevated high place. But Either way, it seems like it would have to be one of those in order to get the name Ela Gabal, God of the Mountain. Consider as well that some Roman historians called Elagabalus Heliogabalus, like Herodian did. There are inscriptions in Baalbek referencing Emesene kings, but none describing Roman emperors other than the Severans, who of course had ties to Emesa. Nearly all Roman coins that display Baalbek were minted by the Severans. Homs is only 100 kilometers from Baalbek, and that's a decent distance in ancient times. But Baalbek is very close to the source of the Orontes River, which flows from Homs to Antioch, and which would make travel reasonable. Ultimately, it will take peace returning to Syria and Lebanon before archaeologists can better excavate Homs to see if the temple was really there, and better explore Baalbek to find its secrets. It's worth a trip to see for yourself. And of course, while you're in Lebanon, if you go to Lebanon, you'll eat Lebanese cuisine, some of the absolute best food anywhere. Now I know, I know, I know. Lebanese cuisine is very much like Syrian, Jordanian, Israeli, and Palestinian cuisine. It's all that Levantine thing. And we've already done the falafel, so that's off the list. So instead I'm gonna focus on one of Lebanon's greatest gifts to the culinary world. The gift its immigrants have brought with them to the four corners of the globe. After all, there are many, many, many more people of Lebanese descent outside Lebanon than within its borders. If you remember the episode on Teotihuacan, Ana talked about the amazing tacos of Mexico City. Every state in Mexico has their own taco specialty, but the purest flavor of the city is the shepherd's taco, el taco al pastor. Chile and pineapple marinated pork sliced from a vertical rotisserie placed in a tortilla with onions and cilantro. None of that, dear listener, came from the Aztecs or the Spanish. We must thank the Lebanese for the Taco al Pastor. They poured into Mexico and their impact has been huge. The richest person on earth currently, by some estimates, is Carlos Slim, a Mexican man of Lebanese descent. 
The taco al pastor was originally shawarma, a staple of Lebanese cuisine. I love it. It's incredibly good. It's also Turkish. It started as the donor kebab, lamb piled up on the vertical rotisserie, which cooks the outside layers as the drippings seep through the meat, keeping it tender and juicy while the cook slices off the crispy deliciousness on the outside. The donor kebab became the Greek gyro from the word to turn like gyrate or gyroscope, and the Levantine shawarma also from the Arabic word to turn. So you know what? We're going to save that for when we get back to Turkey. I have four more episodes on Turkey, and I've already done three. So if I don't save the donor kebab for that, I'm going to be scraping the bottom of the barrel. Instead, let's consider the kibba, a blend of minced meat and bulgur wheat, often molded into balls and deep fried like a meaty falafel, and sometimes just baked like a meatloaf. Popular in Lebanon, but also in places like Brazil and the Dominican Republic. This stuff goes everywhere. I love the football-shaped croquette version. You can honestly use whatever ground meat you like. Beef and lamb are generally best due to flavor and fat content, but you'll be okay with whatever appeals. Start by soaking the bulgur wheat to make it malleable, and then drain the water from it with a cheesecloth. Then, in a food processor, pulse together onions, ground meat, coriander, allspice, cinnamon, salt, and pepper until it's almost a paste. Mix the meat and wheat together. This makes the dough for the kibbeh. Throw that into the fridge for now. For the filling, saute an onion to a golden, and then add more meat to brown it up. Next come toasted pine nuts, and then more cinnamon, allspice, and pepper. Cook it all to aromatic, and then set that mixture aside to cool. Now's the tricky part. You take the dough from the fridge, and with wet hands, grab some of it and form it into an oval shape in your palm. Then add a tablespoon of the filling, and then wrap the dumpling around it into a football shape. That's American football, not I can't believe how bad Argentina have played football. Let the little guys chill for an hour, and then fry them up. They're so delicious. They're like meaty little balls of joy. Enjoy them with hummus, tahini, tabula, or whatever you like your typical Lebanese thing to do. You can even stick them in a pita and make a sandwich. They're great. As always, the recipe will eventually appear on the website, wonderspodcast.com. Please Google it, because apparently Google won't let you know that it's there. So just type it in directly. So let's wrap up the mystery of Elagabalus and his missing temple. His reign may have been a brief four-year blip in Roman history, but it's a fascinating tale regardless. And ultimately, the notion of some random new god from the Middle East ruling over Rome won't seem that outlandish. It might take nearly 2,000 years, but the notion of gender dysmorphia won't seem so outlandish either. I think it's helpful in a day and age when society is debating the basic human rights of people based on their sexuality and gender identity, that these issues aren't new. Gay people did not spring up whole cloth at Stonewall. Transgender people did not suddenly appear a decade ago. It's all part of the rainbow of human being, life's rich pageant, if you will. Lebanon is a country that has somehow found a way to get Maronite Christians, Orthodox Christians, Shia Muslims, Sunni Muslims, and Druze to live together and govern together peacefully. It's taken a while, and it has not been without its challenges. But talk to any Lebanese, and they are intensely proud of their pragmatism. If they can figure it out in that neighborhood, there's hope for us yet. Thank you for listening, downloading, and sharing the show. An enormous thank you to the great Scott Chesworth of the ancient world. Scott's podcast is one of the absolute best to cover antiquity. If you haven't taken the time to listen to it yet, please, you should do so. In the meantime, check out my website at wonderspodcast.com. Facebook is Wonders Podcast. The Twitter is at Wonders Podcast. You can email me at wonderspodcast at gmail, all one word. iTunes reviews are always appreciated. They do make a difference. It's hard to tell sometimes, but they do, and I do love them. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Oh, I forgot. Next week, Scott will join us again as we talk about Palmyra, the other city in Syria that I failed to mention in this episode. That's going to be a good one. But do you know what will even make it better? 
if someone who has actually been to Palmyra before it was destroyed would be willing to talk about it. So ask anyone you know. Please. And I'll see you then.